This is Photographing the West Podcast, the podcast for people who love to explore the western highways and byways while photographing the landscape and wildlife. And now here's your host, Kirby Flanagan. Hello, and welcome to episode number 76 of the Photographing the West Podcast, brought to you by Photo Tees, my wearable art on t-shirts, sweatshirts, and more. Now available on Amazon, Etsy, and Redbubble. Today, my guest is wildlife photographer Hector Astorga, who is based on Santa Clara Ranch in South Texas. Welcome to Photographing the West, Hector. Thank you, Kirby, and thank you for having me here. Pleasure to be here. Uh, it's my pleasure, I'm sure. I love your wildlife photos, so looking forward to getting to know you. Thank you, sir. Appreciate that. So tell everyone about uh, yourself and your photography, how you got started and uh, what you're doing and bring everybody up to date. Sure, sure. Uh, well, like you said, I'm a you know wildlife photographer. I'm based here in, uh, in South Texas. I'm in deep, deep South Texas. I'm in the Rio Grande Valley, which borders, you know, uh, northern Mexico. Um, my, my, my home base is the Santa Clara Ranch. Uh, we are a nature photographer destination here in South Texas. And I also lead photo tours and workshops, you know, all over, you know, um, all over North, Central and South America, as well as Europe and Africa. I've been a nature photographer for about 12 years now, full time for the last six um, I started in photography when I was young, you know, a teenager growing up in Central America. My father was into photography, so I got to play with his, you know, with, with his gear when I was young. Uh, but then, of course, you know, that interest got lost, college, growing up, married. Uh, but about 12 years ago, my interest peaked again as um, I've always been an outdoorsman. I love the outdoors. So I looked into photography as kind of an extension of my outdoor activities. And um, so kind of began like that. And then after, shortly after I started, uh, I started also competing in the Texas Nature Photography Contest, the big one, the Valley Land Fund, and while up in the focus competition. And that was a huge catalyst uh, to my success, you know, as a, as a wildlife photographer. Also, early, early on, um, I got involved with the Santa Clara Ranch. Um, Dr. Gutierrez, who's the owner and, and the, the gentleman that started the ranch, asked me to um, come out to the ranch and take a look at what he was doing and maybe give him some pointers. Uh, that was 10 years ago, and I'm still there. So my involvement at the Santa Clara has always propelled me to where I am today. So tell everyone a little more about Santa Clara Ranch, uh, what it is, and how does photography fit into it? Sure. Uh, the Santa Clara is a photography ranch. Uh, we're in Star County, Texas, which is one of the counties that borders uh, you know, northern Mexico. Uh, we are very unique in the sense that the only operation that happens at the ranch is photography. Uh, we're not a large ranch. We're only 300 acres, so we're very small for Texas, you know, standards. But we only do photography at the ranch. We do not ranch it. We do not farm it. We don't hunt on the property. We only use it for nature photography. So it's very unique in that aspect. Uh, the ranch was started, like I mentioned, by Dr. Beto Gutierrez and his wife, Claire, in 2007. I got involved in 2009 when he invited me to go out there and take a look at what he was doing and maybe give him some pointers and kind of see, um, you know, you know, we were new at this, so we really didn't know much back then. Uh, so I want to check him out. And like I said, I, you know, I'm still there after 10 years. <laughs> the operation has, uh, you know, was very small when I first, you know, when I first got there. I think we, uh, we hosted maybe 15 to 20 photographers that first year. Uh, we now host over 300 Asian photographers every year. And our spring season sells out 12 to 16 months ahead of time. So the ranch has become a major destination for photographers looking to photograph, you know, the huge variety of South Texas birds and wildlife that live on the property. Our property is low fence, uh, so the wildlife is totally free to move around and come in and out of the property. We don't restrict movement of the wildlife by no means. Uh, what we have done is that we have preserved the native uh, habitat, the native brush, you know, the native South Texas brush. We've built uh, water holes. And uh, we built feeding stations for the birds to have, um, for the birds and wildlife to have a place to feel secure at. In front of these water holes, we've uh, put in uh, in-ground sunken blinds. Uh, so that way you can sit comfortably in a blind and be at eye level with the wildlife as they come into the water hole, either to drink or feed. So it gives a very unique and very nice, you know, eye level, low perspective uh, to, you know, to people that are photographing the wildlife that's coming in. Uh, we have six blinds on the property. Three are positioned for morning light. Three are positioned for afternoon light. 
Uh, we have pushed the uh, brush back a little bit to create better backgrounds. And basically everything we have built and everything we have done is to improve you know, the photographic conditions and to make it easier for photographers that come to visit us to get good images. Uh, like I say, it's, it's, it's been a very good success and uh, we're going on our 11th year now and um, it's going very, very strong. We're very proud of what we've done here. It's taking a lot of effort, but uh, we're very proud of what we have done here. Well, that sounds very cool. Looking at your portfolio, you have some really wonderful images in your wildlife portfolio. What What's your secret? <laughs> uh, thank you. Thank you for that. Thank you for the compliment. I really appreciate that. I don't think I have a secret. I think it's just working hard, you know, getting out there and, and perfecting your craft. Uh, when I started, you know, my images were, were not that good. I mean, like a beginner, like any beginner, you know, I didn't really know much. Um, but I did have a desire to get better and I had a desire to improve. I wanted to perfect my photography to the best, you know, to the best of my ability. So I worked very hard at that. Um, it didn't happen overnight, you know, I, I, it took time. I never took any, you know, I can't say I, I was uh, formally trained in photography, but uh, I did read a lot of books. I went online and uh, looked at other people's work and see what's being, you know, what was being done at the time. And uh, I also learned from friends that I met along the way, you know, um, other photographer friends um, by going out with them, sharing ideas, putting your own little twist, you know, into into what we were doing. Uh, so that's kind of how I got, you know, how I got to where I am today. Uh, just, you know, getting out there uh, a lot <laughs> and perfecting your craft and just working hard at it. A lot of my clients tell me that, you know, they admire my work and then I'm, and I'm very talented and this and that. And I always tell them, look, I got here today by hard work. I started, you know, like everybody else. I remember that when I first started photography, the first day I went out that I wanted to do this, I went out at noon thinking that it would be the best light. So that tells you kind of how, how green I was back then. But uh, little by little, learned, you know, learned more and more. And, and again, just worked hard at it. And, um, and, and as of today, I'm still improving. I'm still learning. I'm still trying to perfect more of the, of what, you know, our craft. And uh, I think that what, what, I think that's what makes photography interesting for me is having that challenge to get an image or make your work even better than what it is. Yeah. And there's always something more to learn in photography. That's for sure. That, that is for sure. Yes, sir. That is for sure. So, uh, you know, not only the photography side of it, but also the wildlife side of it, you know, understanding uh, wildlife behavior is a huge part of, of becoming a great, you know, a good uh, nature photographer, understanding uh, light, understanding weather, uh, not only understanding your camera, but of course, a lot of factors come into play to become, uh, you know, to become a good nature, you know, especially me, I, I'm, I'm mostly a wildlife photographer. So that has all come into play to, to where I am today. Sure, that makes sense. Um, you're also into digital art, I see. Uh, talk about your approach to that and what te techniques you use. Yes, you know, early early on, I did more than what I'm doing now. Um, I started digital art, you know, uh, when I, you know, when I first started photographing and started getting some images, uh, I think it was just an extension of what I was doing. I've always been into computers, you know, I, I'm, I have loved computers since I was a kid. I remember getting my first Commodore 64 back in the early 80s. So computers have always been something I really enjoyed working with. So early on, I got into um, you know working with Photoshop. I'm talking you know you know late 80s, early 90s. I think it was Photoshop version two, the very you know the very first version of Photoshop that I used. And this is even before I was a photographer. So I've always had that interest uh, in in computers and uh, and uh, graphic editing and things like that. So when I started my, you know, my career as a photographer, I saw it as another extension of what I, what I could do. So I started playing, you know, playing with Photoshop, uh, doing uh, different, uh, uh, different things to images that are just out of the norm and just uh, kind of uh, thinking outside the box, I guess, if you want to call it, um, by just playing with them and, um, and seeing what would, would come out. And, um, I, you know, I, I, I came up with some pretty, pretty decent ones, I think, you know, and, uh, uh, it's, I wish I could have more time nowadays to do more of it. My schedule and my workload now uh, kind of limits me a little bit of, of doing as much as I would want to do. Uh, but that's kind of how I got into it and kind of what, you know, how my process was. And again, it's it's something that I've been doing since, uh, you know, back in the late 80s, early 90s, playing with, playing with Photoshop. Fortunately, Photoshop's gotten a little easier through the years, uh, I think. Yeah, you know, it has. It, it really has. But, you know, it's funny because uh, I was talking to a, a photographer, a friend, uh, and uh, 
we were talking about certain things and I think it was cloning, you know, he was asking me that, you know, he got some stuff that he needed to clone. And I remember when I first used the clone tool, you know, I think it was Photoshop version two. <laughs> and and that's uh, still the same, you know, a lot stronger and easier, but basic, basic same principle, you know, that's what it was back then. So you limit your workshops to a pretty small number of participants. So talk about the advantages and disadvantages of that. Yes. I'm a big believer in small groups. Uh, I think the experience is much better when you're in a small group uh, doing either a photo tour or, or a workshop. Um, I've always built or done my workshops the way that I think I would enjoy them. In other words, if I was taking a workshop from somebody, how would I want it to be? And that's kind of how I've, I've done mine. Um, most of my workshops, if I'm by myself, if it's just me as a photo leader, maximum number of participants will be six. A lot of them are just four or five. Uh, now, if I have a co-leader or another another professional photographer helping me, I'll go up to eight. But that's the only time I'll do eight. And I don't do anything over eight participants. And I, again, I only do eight if I have somebody else as a co-leader with me uh, helping me out. It's just a much better experience. Uh, I'm a you know I'm a true believer in one-to-one -one participation with the participants. They get to learn more. They get to uh, hear me talk and hear me explain why we photo you know why I photograph the way I do and what are the benefits of you know of doing that. Also, you know when you're when you're traveling around in a large group, you know you have you know sometimes you have conflicting personalities and things like that. By keeping the group smaller. It makes for a much better experience in you know in all aspects uh, of the group. And um, another thing, to be honest, it's easier. I mean, it's easier in, in my end. You know, uh, doing uh, traveling throughout, uh, let's say, you know, traveling throughout uh, Finland or Guatemala, some of the places I do, going with five people versus traveling with 10, 12, 15 people. So uh, again, I, I just believe it's just a much better experience for everybody, and uh, it's it's easier on me. In terms of the negative, I mean. I really don't see one, you know, um, I've always been the type that if, if, if I, if I put a workshop out and it sells out quickly, I'll add another session so other people can join. I'm, I mean, I'm going to Finland, for example, and I'm already there. If my first workshop fills up, which is only a five person workshop, and I still have quite a bit of interest, I'll add a second session. You know, I announce my workshops usually a year, a year and a half in advance. So I have that flexibility that if I do get a lot of response and I do get a lot of to go, I can add a second session and still keep that small group environment for, you know, for both sessions. Yeah, that sounds like a great approach. What, what happens if uh, people cancel out at the last minute and you can't fill their spots? Well, we, you know, we have a policy, you know, on, on, our, on, our, on, our, on our website and with my tour says, you know, since they are very small and, you know, we are limiting the number of people that go, you know, and, and we tell this everybody up front when they sign up, if you do cancel, you know, uh, Without uh, you know, with you know, no matter no matter the uh, the reason, your deposits and your workshop fees are non-refundable unless we can find a replacement for you. If we do find a replacement for you, we will refund your money or we can apply it to a different workshop, whatever you prefer. Uh, but I do have to have somebody to take your spot. If you if you if we don't find somebody to take your spot, unfortunately, you will lose that deposit uh, or or the workshop fees if you already paid the full amount. Uh, what we tell our, all of our clients is, to, you know, we suggest to them if, if you're, you know, if you're not sure, you know, since you are, book, you know, signing up for something that's quite a bit, you know, maybe a year, you know, from now, it's going to happen a year from now. We always tell everybody to get trip insurance. You know, it's well worth it. It's inexpensive, and that way you're protected. And you know, God forbid something happens that you can't make the trip, your your money is secured by having insurance. So we do strongly encourage all of our participants to get insurance because, again, if you do cancel. And if we cannot find somebody to take your spot, you will lose your, your deposit. Now, um, most of my workshops do have a waiting list because, again, they're so small that I do get people that want to sign up that already know that the workshop's already full. And so most of the time, if you give me a good, you know, four or five months ahead of time, most of the time I'll still be able to fill it up. You know, so, you know that way you can get your money back uh, if, if we're able to fill that spot. You do a lot of workshops in Central America and places like Costa Rica and Guatemala. Costa Rica is obviously well known for its bird photography. What's the attraction in Guatemala? Uh, you know, Guatemala for me was uh, something a little different than everybody else. Uh, when I do my when I do my uh, photo trips, I try to do something a little different than everybody else. I try to make them, uh, you know, have a niche in in that market or just do something different. 
like you said, Costa Rica is a well-known location, and you, you know, as you imagine, there's tons of photographers that offer, you know, good trips to Costa Rica. So uh, I always try to make mine a little bit different. Guatemala for me is, um, you know, the main attraction is the volcanoes. Um, I went on my first trip to Guatemala, and uh, I was hooked. You know, um, any place you can climb a dormant volcano and photograph the active one at eye level at a safe distance and create the kind of images that you can create there was, uh, you know, once I did it, I knew that I had to be back every year. Uh, it's just a, uh, a very unique, very, um, you know, exciting type of photography, uh, Fuego Volcano, which is the volcano that we, uh, that we, you know, one of the volcanoes that we visit, uh, has a, a pyroplastic eruption every 20 to 25 minutes. So, uh, you know, you know, we photograph it during the day, which is nice, but it really comes to life at night, you know. So we pretty much spend up all night photographing, doing long exposures, short exposures. There's so much to do, and the volcano is so active that if you miss one, 20, 25 minutes later, it goes off again. <laughs> so it's, it's like nowhere else I've been. It's not easy. I mean, it's not a workshop that's for everybody because we are camping up there. Normally, the way you get up there, it's usually a about a you know seven to an eight hour hike to be able to get to the top of uh, the Acatenango volcano, which is the dormant one. But uh, when we first went down there, we started looking at okay, I don't want my clients to hike eight hours to come up here and photograph. Plus, we're carrying gear. Plus, we gotta carry food. Uh, so we looked at logistics. We looked at how can we make this work? How can we make you know it's a lot easier. You know, it's easy for me and two of my friends to get up there. But once I'm taking, you know, six clients up there, uh, it's a whole other, you know, it's a whole other, whole other beast in terms of logistics. So we looked at different things. We uh, talked to private farms to give us access to their road so we can go up by four by four. So we've made it now that instead of the eight hours hiking to get up there, now it's a two hour four by four drive and a 50 minute hike to get to base camp to where we photograph. So all this went into, you know, planning the trip. Uh, and uh, the other thing about Guatemala is uh, is the culture. You know, the, the Maya population is still very strong in Guatemala. They still have all their indigenous population. So we photograph the Maya markets. We photograph the, the different uh, churches and the different things that, you know, in the, in the small, you know, mountain towns that the population is, I would say, 80 to 85% Maya. So it's very unique uh, in terms of cultural and again, landscapes with, with the volcanoes going off as they do. It's a fantastic place for photography. <laughs> I can't wait to go back this year. I'll be there. I'll be there in March. So uh, are there still Mayan structures uh, from a thousand years ago in uh, Guatemala too, like oh, they are yes, in Mexico? Yes. yes, yes, of course. Guatemala does have a lot of, uh, does have a lot of ruins. Tikal maybe being one of the most famous ones. But we don't, you know, we don't photograph that. We don't go to the ruins. We go to the towns where the Maya population still lives, you know, the, the descendants of the Maya. Uh, they still dress in their very colorful, you know, vestments. And uh, we visit, you know, we visit Market Day in Chichicastenango, which is a small town up in the highlands of the country where you'll have a market with over, I don't know, 500 uh, booths of indigenous people selling their, you know, selling their crafts from everything from vegetables to crafts to textiles. And it's extremely colorful. Um, so it's a very unique, uh, you know, experience, especially for a photographer. What you can do there photography wise, is just unmeasurable. Uh, we visit, uh, we visit Antigua, Guatemala, which is a colonial, one of, you know, a very colonial uh, architecture still, you know, based city. Uh, where uh, we will photograph not only the indigenous population, but also all the colonial structures, the ruins of one, one of the you know one of the earthquakes that destroyed the city back in the 1700s. That's what made the the move to the new Guatemala City. Um, so it's very unique. You know, it's the only trip that I offer that we do not photograph wildlife. It's all landscapes and cultural type photography. Costa Rica has a reputation for being very safe. What about Guatemala? You know. Costa Rica is, by the way, Costa Rica is probably one of the safest countries in Latin America. Guatemala has had a bad rep, similar to Honduras and some of the other Central American nations, but it's like anywhere else in the world. It's where you go and where you not go. Everywhere we visit in Guatemala, it's a high tourist area. So crime is very low. Yes, you know, you might have some petty crime, pickpockets, and things like that, but that can happen anywhere in the world. But uh, every trip that I do, no matter where I'm at, uh, 
you know, Scandinavia, Africa, Central America, South America, I always have a local guide with us at all times. The only time I don't have a local guide is in South Texas because I have a local guide. But every workshop that I offer, I always have local guides, local drivers that know the area, know the country, know where to go, know what to do, know what not to do. And uh, so it's 100% safe for the participant. Good deal. So you mentioned uh, doing something different in terms of workshops, and one of those is Finland. What's the uh, attraction in Finland? Oh, Finland, again, it's uh, one of those that, uh, you know, uh, Finland in, in Europe is one of the hotspots for, for nature photographers. And the U.S. is not well known yet, but in, in Europe it is one of the hotspots for nature photographers. I go in the winter. You know, I'll be there. I'm, I leave next week. I'll be there for, you know, uh, 10 days starting on the 24th of this month. Uh, we photograph, uh, you know, very similar to what we do here in South Texas, where in Finland they have built high, you know, blinds or hides as they call them, that are in perfect position to photograph golden eagles in the snow. So one of the main the targets that we go up there is to photograph golden eagles in snowy conditions, snowy backgrounds, snowy, you know, terrain. We also do landscape photographer in the frozen forest of the, of, you know, in Lapland, uh, where it's. Uh, you know, you're walking on 30 foot of snow and you're photographing the evergreens that are totally covered in snow and are creating this very unique, uh, you know, very unique, very uh, intriguing type, type landscapes. You know, uh, for, for somebody from South Texas, born and raised in Honduras, it was an eye-opening experience when I went to Finland. Totally, you know, totally alien to me, at the, you know, the first time I went. But very photographically uh, a rich land, you know, a lot of, uh, a lot of targets, a lot of, uh, you know, a, a lot of things to do photographic wise in Finland. So it's, um, and uh, I wanted to do something as a winter trip and I did not want to offer Yellowstone. I did not want to offer something that a lot of photographers are offering. So uh, I met some people from, you know, uh, some clients of mine that are originally from Finland and they put me together with uh, the people up in Finland that do the same thing we do here. And uh, one year we decided to go scout it and here we are, you know, now taking groups up there to photograph and it's, it's, it's been great. So are you in the mountains or? No, kind no of we're in the, you know, it's uh, it's pretty flat to where we're at, where we're at. Uh, you have to go really high north. It's got very close to Norway to, to get to the mountains. So uh, I'm not going to say it's flat like like a valley, but it's, you know, it's a hilly terrain type of place. But no, it's not, you know, it's not uh, it's not mountainous area. So it's you're not you're not hiking or you're not working in high altitude. It's all low altitude uh, uh, stuff. Also, it is cold. You know, when we're there last year, I think the coldest it got was minus 17. But it's a very dry cold, uh, and if you're dressed properly, you know it's not it's not bad. Uh, I was a little afraid the first time I went. Okay, I'm gonna be working out in this kind of conditions. You know, coming from South Texas, that's a very <laughs> that's a huge difference. But uh, I was dressed right. You know, I had the right I had the right gear, the right boots, the right gloves. The core of my body was warm, and I was comfortable my whole time that I was there. That's the key when photographing in these kind of conditions. Sure. So, are you snowshoeing or? Or on two around. Yeah, on two of the locations that we uh, that we do landscapes, we snowshoe in. Uh, uh, this in Turi uh, National Park. We snowshoe in. It's about a twenty minute uh, walk to get into the, I guess the the bread and butter of the of the park. You know, from where we park the vehicle, and then we you know we snow, uh, snowshoe in the last 15, 20 minutes. And then at one of the other locations, we go in by uh, snowmobile. Uh, now all the blinds and everything else, we basically drive up to them, and it's about a five ten minute you know walk to get to the blinds, to where the blinds are located. Are you able to see anything in the way of wildlife or it's all landscape? Oh, no, no, no. Like I say, uh, our main target is golden eagles. You know, we're right, yeah, you mentioned golden. that. Yeah, and then, uh, of course, on, on, on top of that, we're photographing all the, uh, you know, the northern uh, European species of birds from, uh, you know, we're doing Eurasian jays, uh, Siberian jays, black woodpecker, gray woodpecker. Uh, we have, uh, I would say, 50 to 20 species of birds that we photographed. We also do dippers at one of the few rivers that still has non-frozen water. We photographed uh, river otters at that location as well. So yes, we do quite a, you know, we do wildlife. Um, I would say that trip is 60% wildlife, 40% landscape. Okay. So you're now offering a tour to Patagonia for 2020. How did that come about and how did you prepare for it? Uh, yes. Uh, Patagonia had always intrigued me. Now, you know, I started seeing the images that were coming out of, uh, you know, of Chile, especially the Torre del Paine area, in terms of uh, mountain lions. 
you know, in all my years as a as a outdoorsman, you know, I've only here in the U.S. I had only, I've only seen one wild mountain lion in my you know in my life. It was around it was in Laredo, Texas. We were driving back to camp. It was about 300 yards away. We thought it was a bobcat at first. It was backlit. We stopped to look at it with the binoculars, and then the cat got up and walked walked into the brush, and I noticed a long tail. You know, and that was the only time I've ever seen a, a, a you know a mountain lion in the wild before I went to Chile. So when I first went to Chile, I was expecting, you know, I, you know, I've been seeing the images coming out and talking to other photographers. You know, I was expecting we were gonna be, you know, 100, 100 some yards from these cats, we were gonna photograph them. Um, but uh, we, you know, we, we visited the, the estancias, which is the private farms that border the park. The amount of wild mountain lions that are there is just mind boggling. Not only that, but they're 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 semi habituated to people, so you can get fairly close. I think we got to about maybe 25, 30 yards from them to be able to photograph them, and you realize how much food they have out there with all the guanacos and all the other wildlife that's there. You know their main their main food supply that they're really not interested in us. But the experience was just phenomenal. You know we uh, we trekked for five days, and in those five days we saw. I'm guess I'm gonna guess this. I don't quite remember, but I think we saw 16 wild pumas, and we photographed seven of them very successfully. One of them actually was a mom with her four with her four cubs, or her you know her four kittens, and um, an experience like no other. Uh, we do everything out of private land, you know, uh, and it's not in the it's not in the park. It's a private land that borders the uh, the park. We have a local guide, of course, that's with us at all times, and we also have a trekker. That his uh, his mission is basically to find the cats and get as close to them. Uh, I do a little bit different. I, I use four by four vehicles so that way you can get a little closer, and the hike is not as long. Because uh, if you're using the uh, you know like the sprinter type bands, you have to park on the road, and of course you have to hike the rest of the way. So I've made it a little bit easier for the clients so that we're using four by four vehicles, so we get to about maybe you know 20 25 minute walks to where the cats are at. Uh, from where we park the truck, so it makes it easier, makes the hikes a little bit shorter. You still hike quite a bit, but it's um, it's easier, and uh, we can concentrate more on photography than actual hiking to get to them. Do you spend any time in the park or down around uh, Torre del Paine? Yes, we do. Actually, the 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 estancia that we use borders the park. You know, uh, the, the it's a it's a huge estancia, you know, estancia farm. Uh, it used to be a uh, it used to be a uh, you know they were sheep herders. Uh, they don't do that anymore now. They basically cater to people coming to see the pumas. But uh, it borders the park, so we're we're where we're photographing the cats. We can see the Torres del Pines, you know, granite towers in the background. They're right there. We're right next to the park. Out of the the trip is 10 days, and out of the 10 days, two days we do landscapes in the park. Uh, you know, we'll go in there and we'll do landscapes. Because, you know, you, know, you can't go to Patagonia and not do landscapes. The, the place is just uh, uh, gorgeous, beautiful, you know, with uh, with the glacier-fed lakes, the granite, you know, uh, domes, the, uh, you know, the end of the Andes coming in, the snow-covered mountains. It's just, uh, it's just a, again, an, another photographer paradise. But my trip is, I would say, uh, 80% uh, chasing pumas and chasing other wildlife and 20% landscape on on that trip. Okay. Yeah, that sounds exciting. We haven't talked about your Africa trips, uh, so tell us about those. Yes, uh, I uh, I do too. I, right now I'm doing two countries, and I'm starting to uh, scout a third one. I, I go to Kenya, and I go to Uganda. Uh, my Kenya trip is, uh, it's uh, I call it the Kenya photo adventure. Uh, we visit, uh, you know, we visit five different uh, game reserves. Uh, we go to Sambulu Game Reserve. We go to Oel Pajeta, which is the only private one, uh, Sweetwater's Camp. We do Lake Naivasha. And then we do both sides of the Mara. I go to the Naruk side of the Mara, and I also go to the Triangle side of the Mara. Uh, so it's very unique that a lot of people offer trips to Kenya. They basically concentrate and base themselves in the Mara, and that's all they do. I like to you know, mix it up a little bit. So we go to the five different, uh, you know, the five different reserves because you can get different targets. And the scenery changes a bit from one reserve to the other. Some boors more uh, brushland versus the grasslands that you see at the Mara. Uh, also, some areas are better for certain things than others. You know, one of the main things we target in Samburu is leopards. My best leopard, uh, you know, work has been in Samburu. It's phenomenal for leopards. So I love Samburu for that aspect. Also, we'll have reticulated giraffes. We'll have garanooks that we don't see anywhere else but at Samburu. Mara, of course, is great. Uh, and we're there doing migration. 
we try to avoid the river as much possible because it can get you know pretty crowded that time of year. So once we uh, you know once we get a good river crossing, once we photograph one river crossing, we abandon the river area and we go outside you know to other places of the you know of the mar to photograph the innumerable things that are out there you know um so um it's 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 a fantastic trip to get an all around perspective of what's available in kenya in these five different reserves um, my other trip also I, also I also go to uganda and there of course the main concentration is primates i go to uh, be windy for mountain gorillas our trips are usually three you know we do three treks uh, with mountain gorillas and i also go to kibali for the chimpanzees and we'll do two treks uh, with the chimpanzees in Kibali. So it's uh, uh, Uganda is really more of a primate photo trip. We don't do lions and things like that in, in Uganda. You know, it's, it's, it's more concentrating on the chimpanzees and the mountain gorillas. So when you're in Kenya, are you driving between reserves or flying or how does that work? We do both. We do both. Uh, we do drive between Samburu, uh, Sweetwaters, and Naivasha because the drives are short. And we drive. And the way I've planned it is that we drive in the middle of the day. You know, we'll spend three days on one location, and then we move in the middle of the day. So you still get to photograph the days we switch camps. We, you still get to photograph the morning and the afternoon. When we go to the Mara, we do fly. The road to the Mara is not the greatest. It's it's uh, it's a very rough road. It's getting better, you know, they are fixing it, but it's still pretty rough and it's a long drive. We would lose a whole day driving. So what we do is that once we're done at Naivasha, we, uh, you know, we get on bush planes and we fly over to the Mara. Uh, the way I've done it is that uh, to, to make it easy for participants with gear and stuff, we only fly with our photo gear. All of our regular lug luggage follows us by land. So we don't have to be worrying about weight restrictions on the small planes and things like that, because we only get on the planes with our photo gear. Everything else follows us by land, and it catches up to us later that day. Uh, so we fly to the Mara, and then of course, uh, once the workshop is done, we fly back to Nairobi to avoid that long, you know, that long drive uh, back back to Nairobi. Uh, so it's a mixture of both. We do driving, but we also do bush planes. And same in Uganda. You, you have local guy. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Like okay. I said earlier, you know, like I said earlier, uh, everywhere I go, I have a local guy with him. my guys in, in okay. Kenya. I've been I've been working with them now for six years. Uh, and I have the same, uh, you know, two, three drivers that I've always used, and they're, they're excellent. One of the reasons my Kenya trips are so successful and everybody comes home happy is because of, you know, the guides and the drivers that I have over there. They're fantastic. Yeah, everybody says those are the key, all right. It is, you know, it is. And it's funny because sometimes, you know, I always tell my participants when we get to Kenya, you know, one of the main things we have to do, guys, is trust your driver, you know. They're here all the time. They know what they're doing. They know 10 times more than what I do. Uh, if our driver says we need to move or if our driver says we have a better chance going here versus here, trust the drivers. And, uh, you know, it's always worked for me. Uh, we've always had good subjects, good activity, and the photography has always been fantastic in Kenya. Good deal. So uh, before we go, why don't we talk about photo gear? What do you like to use for wildlife in particular? Uh, well, you know, I'm a, mostly, a, mostly a wildlife photographer, of course, you know, I, uh, long lenses. Uh, I'm a big 500 shooter. I mean, I would say that's, uh, if you look at my work, I would say that 70% of my work is with my 500. I also shoot, you know, my 500 f4. I also shoot uh, the uh, two, 2 to 400 f4 as well. I'm a Nikon shooter, so those are my two go-to lenses for wildlife. Um, in terms of uh, landscapes, uh, 16 to 35, fish eye 14. 24 to 70. Those are my go-to lenses for that. One of the things that I've been doing more and more now, uh, especially when I go out by myself, I'm starting to do more setups of wildlife using wide angle lenses. I mean, I think that that has, um, it gives just such a unique, you know, perspective when you start doing wildlife subjects with a wide angle lens. And I do this by either building setups, using hides, remote triggers, and things like that. Uh, so that's something that I'm doing a little bit more now. Uh, but still, my 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 go-to lenses are my 500 and my 2 to 400. So, are you using the 500 PF or or the? Uh, no, I'm my, my 500 F4. Just you know, the big guy, <laughs> the big heavy guy. The PF is great. I mean, it's a it's a fantastic lens. Uh, small, you know, portable for somebody that uh, does not want to be carrying the big lenses anymore. I, mean, I have a lot of clients, you know, that are you know up, you know, they're getting up there in years and they travel a lot and they don't want to be carrying the big lenses. The PF is a great alternative, uh, but for me personally, I'm a you know I'm an early early morning shooter, especially here at the ranch, or a late late afternoon shooter. So light is you know minimal, uh, so I need the F4 to be able to keep my ISO low. 
plus most of my personal photography is done from either blinds or decks or hides or from a vehicle. I rarely hike for wildlife. I try to use established hides or established blinds to do most of my wildlife work. So uh, you won't catch me hiking three hours to go photograph something. Uh, that's not fun. <laughs> it's uh, I like to do. <laughs> no, more. it's not. <laughs> I like to do more high photography on a tripod, on a, or in some kind of support. So my big lenses still work very well for me. Now, if I uh, if I had the need to be able to hike and do something like that, the PF would be a fantastic uh, lens. But as of yet, I don't I don't I don't see me doing that you know, anytime soon. So again, I use I use my big lenses. Do you uh, shoot with any mirrorless cameras? I do not. I do not. Um, more and more of my clients are going mirrorless for multiple still shooting, you know, DSLRs. Um, I think my main uh, reason is that I love the optical viewfinder. I still cannot get used to that electronic viewfinder. Uh, I like to see what's happening in real time. And uh, I've tried playing, you know, with, I've played with quite a few of the mirrorless cameras and they're getting better. You know, some of these cameras that are coming out now, they are fantastic. I just like my optical viewfinder. <laughs> and um, so, no, I, I don't shoot mirrorless. I still shoot DSLRs. Okay, fair enough. So tell everyone where they can find you, your photography and your workshops. Uh, yes, the easiest way to find me is online on my website. My website is basically my name, uh, www.hectorastorga.com. Um, there you can find information of uh, all the different workshops and uh, all the different trips that I offer. Uh, you can also find me on Instagram, uh, Hector Astorga Photography. I have a pretty uh, pretty big uh, Instagram account. And you can also find me on social media on Facebook, just by my name, Hector Astorga. And uh, you should be able to find me in those three locations. Uh, for information on the ranch, the ranch has its own website. The ranch is uh, santaclararanch.com. All the information about the ranch and uh, everything pertaining to the ranch can be found there. Uh, of course, if you have any information, you know, if you need anything information on the ranch or you want to visit the ranch, you can just contact me directly and I can um, I can take over uh, for that. Okay, good. I'll, I'll put all that info in the show notes too so people can find it. Thanks for being on uh, Photographing the West, Hector. It's uh, been a lot of fun. I really love your wildlife photography, as I said in the beginning. Uh, show notes can be found at www.flanaganphotos.com, spelled F-L-A-N-A-G-A-N-F-O-T-O-S. Please tell your friends and fellow photographers about the podcast. We'll be back on February 15th. Bye for now. Thanks for listening to Photographing the West podcast. Please subscribe to the podcast in iTunes and leave us a review. Till next time, here's wishing you safe travels and good light. <laughs>